Hey guys, welcome to today's MCAT question of the day. As always, we will be working our way through one of the many MCAT practice problems found at MCATselfprep.com, the home of the free MCAT prep course. I'm Andrew George, a 99th percentile MCAT tutor, and I'll be walking you through today's problem as if you were one of my private tutoring students. Be sure to hit pause and try this practice problem for yourself before watching my explanation. In approaching this practice problem, I want us to look at each answer choice individually to get a better understanding of it. And that's actually what I really recommend to my students is that whenever you have a behavioral sciences question and it gives you a list of four different terms, if you get that question wrong or even if you get it right, make sure you understand what all four of those terms mean, especially when you're doing AMC practice problems because that's a gold mine of information. It's a perfect way to study because you're learning the exact terms that the AMC uses and that's what you're going to see on test day. So I highly recommend making sure you understand what each answer choice means. And if we look at these four answer choices, you'll notice that each of them are a different visual cue. Whether it's a monocular cue, meaning that it, it's a cue that relies on one eye, or it's a binocular cue that relies on the use of both of your eyes. And these visual cues allow us to perceive visual information. So, for instance, some of these visual cues might allow us to tell if objects are close or far away. Or it might they might help us determine if one object is in front of another object or if one object is big or small. You know, these visual cues allow us to perceive that visual information that's all around us. The first visual cue that we will discuss is motion parallax. And it's a monocular cue which relies on information you can gather as you're traveling somewhere. For instance, in this case, we have a businessman who you know, he's got a newspaper in his hand, but he doesn't seem to be paying too much attention to it. He's more interested in the information outside of his window. He's probably thinking about motion parallax right now. And so let's discuss what he's probably thinking as he looks out this window. And what he's probably thinking is that, wow, this, this bush is moving really fast. Like it's flying by him. You know, if, if, that was a, if he was going through a tunnel, for instance, and the tunnel wall was right next to his face, it would look like the bricks are just flying past his face, right? The closer the object, the faster it looks like it's moving. And that seems to be the case in this image because if you look back here, that cloud, it's moving really, really slow. So objects that are close will appear like they're moving faster than objects that are far away. So if you look out your window and you notice something's moving quickly, your brain will immediately tell you, oh, that object's close. Or if something's moving slowly, Oh, that object's far away, right? And that's what this monocular cue is doing for us. Another aspect of this, of this visual cue is that um, objects that are closer, like the bush and the fence, they seem to be moving backwards, right? Whereas the house, the tree, and the sky, they all seem to be moving forwards. And that's another pattern that our brain recognizes, is that objects that are closer appear to be moving backwards more often whereas objects that are farther away appear to be moving forwards. The next visual cue I want to discuss is shading and contour. If you look at this image, you'll notice that this part is shaded and this part is not. And that helps us determine the shape of this 3D object. If there was no shading, we wouldn't even be able to perceive that this is a 3D object, right? It would just look like, it would just look like these squiggly lines right? That's all we'd really perceive is squiggly lines. We wouldn't really be able to perceive that this has a, is a 3D object that has depth, right? This is a, this is an indent, whereas this is a, I don't know what you'd call that, like an outdent. Um, yeah, so you notice that one goes in and one comes out, right? It's, it's this shading that allows you to understand the contour of the object, right? The same thing down here, we notice that this is shaded in, and so it looks like, it looks like this is a an indent right there, whereas this is not shaded, so it looks like this little hill. And we can kind of perceive that this is a 3D object, right, based on the shading that is seen here. The next visual cue I want to discuss is convergence. And convergence is a binocular cue that relies on the idea that objects that are closer require your eyes to bend inward more. For instance, if I'm moving my pen really close to my face, as I move it closer and closer, my eyes will turn more and more inward towards that pen until I'm eventually cross-eyed, right? And so our brain, 
based on how much our eyes are turning inward, will tell us how far away that object is. For instance, in this case, we have an object that's far away, and the eyes are not turning inward very much, right? Just very slightly turning inward. The brain is going to determine how far inward those eyes are turning and say, oh, you know what, we're not turning inward very much. This object must be far away. Whereas in the second instance, we have an object that's much closer. The eyes are turning in far more. Therefore, the brain will get a signal that, oh, wow, our eyes are turning in a lot. This must be a really close object. And that's the idea of the visual cue of convergence. The closer the object, the more our eyes are going to turn inward. The last visual cue I want to discuss is called retinal disparity. It's a binocular cue that relies on the idea that one eye will see one thing while the other side, eye will see something else. For instance, in this image, this guy is holding his finger up in front of this red house. And when he sees it with his left eye, it looks like his finger is in front of the house. When he sees it with his right eye, it looks like the finger is no longer in front of the house. And you can try this for yourself. Hold your finger up in front of you know, whatever object is in front of you, close one eye, and then close the other, and you'll notice that the, the, uh, the overlap between the two images will change based on which eye is open versus closed, right? And the idea is that the, the closer the object to your eye, the more disparity there will be between the two images you see. For instance, hold your finger up right next to your face, and then look through one eye at your finger, and then the other. And you'll notice that you'll see an entirely different side of your finger depending on which eye is open versus which one is closed. Now look at something really far away from you. If you open one eye and then open the other one, you'll notice that the retinal disparity for that object is not very much. The image almost looks exactly the same in no matter which eye is opened versus closed, right? That's the idea of retinal disparity. The more disparity between the images you are seeing, the more your brain will interpret that object as being closer, right? And the amazing thing about our brain is it can take both these images and convert them into one, right? When you look at something that's close up, you don't see two images. You, you see a single image because your brain is taking those two images and converting them into one. All right, let's take a final look at this question one more time. As John looks at a tree in the distance, his eyes are relaxed. However, when he begins to look at a pencil on the desk in front of him, his eyes must turn toward the pencil. The relaxing and turning of John's eyes muscles of John's eye muscles allow John to have sense of depth. Which binocular cue does this refer to? Okay, so if you remember, um, when we talked about convergence, we were talking about the idea of the closer an object to your eye, eyes, the more your eyes have to turn inward towards that object. And that's exactly what's happening here. When John is looking at the pencil, his eyes are converging even more, telling his brain that the pencil is up close. So this one is clearly convergence. If you liked this MCAT question of the day, be sure to give it a like. And for more MCAT questions of the day, be sure to subscribe to this channel and enroll in our free MCAT prep course found at MCATselfprep.com. And if you are really looking to maximize your MCAT score, feel free to visit my tutoring profile page and request a free 10-minute phone consultation. I would love to chat with you about your situation and how you can maximize your MCAT score. I look forward to hearing from you soon, and we'll see you next time.